Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started on our jury nullification panel. Welcome to the first panel of Friday. Um, I want to start off with a, well first I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Lindsay LaSalle. I'm a law fellow with our Office of Legal Affairs at DPA in Berkeley. And I want to start off with a question and that is how many of you when you get a jury summons are super excited to get it in the mail. You can't wait to rip it open, see when you're gonna report. All right, so we, we have a couple, we have a couple. Well, basically the point of this panel is at the end of this, that should be your feeling when you get that jury summons in the mail. You should be excited because you know that this is a tool for activism to end the war on drugs, that you as one juror have the potential to change an individual case, and if enough individual cases get changed to really make an impact um, on the policies and the laws that have so failed and that are incarcerating hundreds of thousands of uh, nonviolent drug offenders. As many of you know, jury nullification is a very old concept. Its early proponents included John Adams and John Hancock, but it actually is a new topic to DPA's conference. This is the first time that there has been a panel on it, so I'm very honored to be moderating this session, and I'm especially honored to be sharing the stage with pretty much the foremost experts and advocates on this issue. Each of them are going to have um, some time to talk about what they're doing in the area of jury nullification, and then we'll be opening it up to questions at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them briefly now and what they'll be speaking about, and then I'll give a more in-depth bio as each of them come up to present. Um, first, we have Clay Conrad, who will be giving us an overview of jury nullification, what exactly it is, um, some context and history, and really providing the perspective for the rest of the discussion. Um, next, we have Tim Lynch, who is going to be talking about some of the newer developments in jury nullification, particularly some interesting legislation that has been passed. Then we have Kirsten Tainan, who is going to be discussing jury nullification advocacy and public education campaigns and how basically we can spread the word about jury nullification and really get people to get excited about that jury summons. And finally, Steve Silverman will be talking about a movie that he is developing that is going to be focusing on jury nullification and teaching people about this right that they have and also to discuss how social media and jury nullification um, can help build this movement. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Clay Conrad, who is the author of the leading academic work on jury nullification, which I have a copy of right here. Um, he's also doing a book signing today from 3.30 to 4, so if you have additional questions that don't get answered in this panel, or if you just want to chat Clay up, definitely stop by. Um, he's a lawyer in private practice with Looney and Conrad. Um, he's in, involved in all stages of criminal defense, so is really um, the foremost legal expert on jury nullification. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as Lindsay said, I'm a lawyer in private practice. The firm is Looney and Conrad PC. We're on the web. I'm going to talk about the history and background of jury nullification uh, and maybe give some context for the other speakers. Oh, I'm sorry. Usually they give you a stand for these things. <laughs> Jury nullification is the act of a criminal trial jury in refusing to convict on conscientious grounds in spite of proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt because they think the law is unjust, the law is misapplied, or the punishment is inappropriate. Uh, we'll get into the nuts and bolts later of how it happens, but understanding it requires an understanding of what the Founding Fathers' concept of a criminal trial jury was and why we use juries to determine guilt or innocence in America. Uh, do we have any other lawyers in here? <laughs> How many of you are criminal defense lawyers? Most of you, good. Uh, well, as lawyers, we learn that juries determine the facts and judges determine the law. And as a general rule, that's all right, but juries also have a political role. That's why they were created. They've always had that role. That's what the founders intended to protect in the Sixth Amendment, and that's what is also guaranteed in the constitutions of all 50 states. 
Now, jury trial can be traced back at least to the Sumerians, but I'm going to start with the Magna Carta in 1215. Some folks trace it back further, but for our purposes, I think 798 years of background is going to be enough. Um, prior to Magna Carta, King John would say, the law is in my mouth. It was whatever he said it was. Now, when the nobility fought against King John, forced him to sign the Magna Carta, uh, so that someone, well, when they forced him to sign the Magna Carta, we can probably presume that they wanted to put something more than an illusory protection for the people uh, in place. The Magna Carta only protected the nobility, but it's the foundation for the Sixth Amendment that protects everybody. And the Magna Carta said that a person could only be convicted by a jury of their peers. Now the peers were the peer agent and the nobility. But today in America, everyone has a right to a jury trial from the community in which the offense was allegedly committed. Now, in ancient England, all felony offenses were punishable by death. So one reason trial judges liked jury nullification is that it gave them a shield. There was a barrier between them and the death penalty. It was the jury that inflicted it. If the defendant's family wanted to get revenge, they could go after the jurors. The judge was just the guy there to write down the jury's verdict. Uh, that protected judges from retaliation. It also allowed jurors acting as the community to determine who deserved to die. And a lot of times, they would take a guilty person and say, well, maybe he doesn't deserve to die. Maybe we can find a lesser offense. Maybe we can find him not guilty because he had a good reason. And judges, for the most part, were pretty comfortable with this. Uh, in fact, I found one case in which Lord Mansfield, who was a pretty strict judge, was trying a theft case. Uh, and the theft case involved jewelry. And the prosecutor said that the fashion alone of that piece of jewelry was sufficient to take it over the value to become a felony offense. A Lord Mansfield responded, are you suggesting that we hang a man for fashion's sake? And Lord Mansfield was known as a strict judge, so if he was in favor of jury nullification in this sort of case, we can assume that the judiciary was not really that opposed to it in run-of-the-mill cases. But in politically charged cases, their attitude would change. Um, seditious libel cases were the bulk of politically charged cases uh, in early England or in uh, 17th century England, let's say, that period, 16th, 17th century. Now, our modern concept of jury nullification comes from that period and from those sorts of cases. Uh, and it was perhaps best expressed by freeborn John, John Lilburn uh, in his 1649 treason trial, where he asserted that the jurors were judges of both fact and law, and that the judges just existed to write down the jury's verdict. Now, the understanding of the phrase, judges of both fact and law has changed over the years because our understanding of where the law comes from has changed. Back in that period of history, people believed in natural law doctrine. That was the generally, expect, generally accepted understanding of where the law comes from. Um, law was considered part of natural science to be discovered. Today, we have a much more technocratic understanding of the law. Uh, natural law doctrine has given way to a positive, formalistic conception of law. But under natural law doctrine, when you say that the jury are the judges of fact and law, it means that they can determine where justice lies, because justice is what the law was. It was the understanding of what was just that was their understanding of the law. Uh, he was saying that the law required them to do what was right. That's pretty primitive according to our modern understanding of law. Today, 
judges tell jurors to go ahead and commit injustice in the name of law. And we call that progress. <laughs> Following Lilburn's trial was the 1670 case of William Penn and William Meade, in which the jurors were punished for acquitting the two men of conducting a tumultuous assembly for holding a Quaker meeting. This is important because it is the only time in history where a Quaker meeting has been deemed a tumultuous assembly. <laughs> Four of the jurors were jailed for their verdict. Eight of them paid a fine. Uh, because when they acquitted William Penn and William Meade, the court disagreed with them and said that you have gone against your oath and therefore you're guilty of perjury. And he fined them, uh, I think it was 45 marks a piece, I can't remember. Eight of them paid it, four of them went to jail and filed a writ of habeas corpus. That writ was entitled Bushell's case. And Bushell's case held that the jury could not be punished for their verdict, and that's still the law. Now, Bushell's case did not deal with jury nullification. I think that's a common misunderstanding. What Bushell's case dealt with was that a juror could not be punished for their verdict because the judge could not determine how the jurors decided the facts. It gave protection to jury nullification because jury nullification exists as a disingenuous fact finding. That's how jury nullification works. You're sitting on the jury, you vote not guilty. It is mercy hiding behind a disingenuous fact finding. Uh, jury nullification, first famous American case, not the first case in the US, but the first famous one, was the John Peter Zenger case in New York in 1749, in which he was acquitted of seditious libel for publishing the New York Gazette, or the New York Journal, I'm sorry, which was critical of the royally appointed governor. Um, the Zenger case was argued by Andrew Hamilton, who was the most accomplished lawyer in the colonies, uh, and it was the trial of the 18th century. The transcript of the trial was available in at least nine printings in England. Um, it was widely circulated across the British Empire. Uh, it was the most important seditious libel case in the colonies, and it was the foundation of both our understanding of where a jury comes from and our understanding of freedom of the press. In the book, I argue that this is the history the founders knew. This was the background that they wrote. This was the background they had in mind when they wrote the Sixth Amendment. They understood the powers of the jury as having the right. They understood jurors as having the authority to acquit in the teeth of law and facts when uh, the law was wrong. The, in the Zenger case, Hamilton's defense was that John Peter Zenger was telling the truth. The law of seditious libel said the truth doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, it's more libelous if it's true. That's an aggravating factor. <laughs> because people will believe it if it's true. And it's more harmful to the crown if the damaging information you print is true than if it's false. So the jury was told, I know those are your instructions, but look to your knowledge of the community. Look to your knowledge of the facts. And if you believe these things are true, you can find him not guilty. They were told by Hamilton, where a jury does not question the law, they become useless, if not worse. That was their understanding of where a jury come from, comes from. Now, jury nullification existed in early US history, in alcohol cases, fugitive slave cases, and death penalty cases. Um, the uh, 
Supreme Court in 1895 decided a murder case, Sparf and Hansen versus U.S., in which they determined that they did not have to, a court did not have to allow jury nullification to be argued in front of the jury. They didn't say that a court couldn't allow it, they just said they didn't have to. So what we have is a conservative court that at that time was cracking down on union organizing, was uh, protecting corporations against immigrants and citizens, and was using the jury uh, nullification argument, was using this restriction on the power of juries to keep juries from acquitting un union organizers, to keep them from uh, having their own judgment on these cases. Remember, at the same time, the jury pool was widening. We're getting more immigrants. We're getting, uh, <coughs> we're on the verge of allowing minorities and women onto juries. The jury pool is getting broader, and therefore, we have to restrict its authority to keep it under control. When the jury consisted of the upper class, it was much easier to give them the authority to come into their own judgments. Now, jurors still knew they had this prerogative, though, even though they weren't learning about it in court. It was part of American history and tradition. And therefore, during the Prohibition era, as many as 60% of cases ended in acquittals. Uh, and Prohibition only banned production, sales, and distribution. It didn't ban possession. It didn't ban consumption the way the drug laws do today. But still, 60% of what we would now call dealers were being acquitted under jury nullification because jurors refused to convict in those cases. So the challenge for us as lawyers, for those of you who are lawyers, is to get jurors to act on this prerogative. Most people are sickeningly, sickeningly obedient to authority. And if you're not familiar with the Stanley Milgram experiments, let's talk about that later. But people do what they're told. As lawyers, we have to learn to free them from that obedience to authority. As activists, we need to educate potential jurors because they're not going to learn about this prerogative in court. So they have to know about it before they come into court if we have any hope of them acting on it. And as citizens, we simply need to show up for jury duty. We need to keep our mouths shut during jury selection as much as possible. Not lie, but not volunteer anything. And if we just show up, we'll have an outsized impact on future cases because the world is run by those who show up. And with that thought, I'll turn the microphone over to the next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Lynch. He is the director of Cato's Project on Criminal Justice, which has become the leading voice in support of the Bill of Rights and Civil Liberties. He is a prolific writer on jury nullification, number of articles, and as I mentioned, he is going to be packing up some leading developments, some new developments of jury nullification. Instead of holding a mic, I'm just going to try to project. If you guys can't hear me in the back of the room, just, just raise your hand. Um, as Lindsay said, I am going to focus in my talk on a very interesting law that was passed uh, in New Hampshire in 2012 and that went into effect in January of this year. But to understand how that new law in New Hampshire is going to affect and change things, we have to be very clear about how the law is operating today. So let's start right there. Um, Clay gave this great historical background, but again, I'm going to kind of bring it up to the present day. And for those, I, I didn't know we'd have so many uh, lawyers here this morning, but for those of you who don't know, at, at the conclusion of every criminal trial, we're the jury... We're not understanding you easily. Oh, I'll, okay. I'm thinking that I project a little harder. <laughs> From your diaphragm! <laughs> We'll try the microphone idea. Pretend you're, we're a, a jury pool of a lot of old deaf people. <laughs> <laughs> Which is who our jury jurors often are. Okay, the, this jury microphone jury helps guy. a lot, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. At the conclusion of every criminal trial, just before the jury goes off to deliberate, the judge gives them a set of legal instructions. 
And these instructions are very, very important because the jurors that show up for service, they want to do the right thing. And while they listen to the attorneys for the defense and the prosecution, they turn to the judge for guidance on what they can and cannot do. And they give the judge a great deal of deference. They, 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 they turn to the judge for what they can and cannot do. And the typical instruction that the jurors hear each and every week goes something like this. This is the judge talking to the jurors. Your job is to determine the facts. My job is to instruct you on the law. It is your duty to follow the law as I explain it to you, even if you disagree with it. So get the idea? You're to leave your conscience and your opinions and your convictions outside the courthouse. It's not proper to bring them in. Now again, the typical juror wants to act properly. Uh, and the judge has told them that they can't question the wisdom of the rules. So, you can understand what happens in some of these drug cases we all read about. I mean, take a case that goes into federal court where somebody is on trial for marijuana possession. And the defense wants to say, my client has a medical condition. She was using marijuana for medical purposes. To, she has cancer. She was smoking marijuana to help her appetite because she's undergoing chemotherapy treatment. The federal prosecutor would say, this evidence shouldn't even come into court, judge. There's no medical exception under federal law, so all that information is irrelevant. Tell the jury they're to, just to follow the rule. There's, it's very strict federal law. There's no exception for medical purposes. Your duty is to follow the law even if you disagree with it. So what's going to happen in that case? Very likely the, judges, the jurors are going to think, I don't like this, but we have to follow the law, and they're going to bring in a conviction. Yesterday, at the beginning of the session, Ethan Nadelman mentioned that even as the momentum for reform swings over into our favor, we do have some odd regulations that are on the books. Here in Colorado, you know, you can grow marijuana at home, but there are limits, right? Up to six plants. So what happens if the police arrest someone and they find eight to ten plants in their possession? What's going to happen then? Maybe the prosecutors are going to want to make an example out of this person. You know, we've got rules. We've got to follow them. So what's going to happen when the jury hears those instructions? You have to follow the rules even if you disagree with them. Again, we're likely to get a conviction in that case when those are the jury instructions. Okay, so this is what typically happens. Now we come to this New Hampshire uh, situation and what, they, what they've done there. New Hampshire has this new law that makes it unique among the 50 states. Here is what the new law there says. In all criminal proceedings, the court shall permit the defense to inform the jury of its right to judge the facts and the application of the law in relation to those facts and controversy. This is big. Uh, Cato Institute published Clay Conrad's book back in 1998. When we learned about this new law coming into effect, that a legislature had enacted this law and a governor had signed it, this is big, and that's why we republished his book, because we think this is a big development. Jury nullification is going to be coming back, and it's important to get this scholarship out uh, in greater circulation nowadays. Now, again, this New Hampshire thing is different. In all of the courthouses and all the other states, public defenders and defense attorneys are not allowed to... to inform the jury of these things. You know, you hear it on TV, you know, these, uh, when these court controversies in TV where the, you know, the judge gets angry, I'm going to hold you in contempt of court. You know, that's how the power that the judges use to keep defense attorneys in line from arguing the justice of a rule or law in court. Okay? So we've had this new law in effect in, uh, since January in New Hampshire. What, how's it been working out so far? Well, it's not the easiest thing to find out because as I learned from Clay Conrad's book, you know, jurors are not organized. They do not, you know, at the end of cases, they don't hold press conferences and say, this is what we did, this is why we did it. There's no institutional support behind jurors the way they are between, the way there is uh, behind prosecutors and, and police. So, you know, they, when the case is over, they go home. They go back to their families and go back to work. But I did call some defense attorneys up in New Hampshire to give the, me their impression as to how the new law is working. 
They say it's been a mixed bag so far. They said that when they're able to argue jury nullification, they get an acquittal or at least a hung jury uh, and, and then a mistrial. And I said, well, what do you mean when you can argue nullification? The new law says in all criminal prosecutions, the court shall permit the defense to argue. Okay? It turns out that some of the judges up there are fighting back and are basically ignoring the new law. And they're doing this in two ways. First, sometimes the judge might say, I'm going to decide if this is a nullification case or not. If I think it's a nullification case, then you can argue nullification. If I don't think this is a nullification case, then you can't argue nullification. It goes right against the spirit of the new law. The second way the judges have undermined the new law is by allowing the defense to make their nullification argument to the jury, but then they give a misleading instruction to the jury uh, right before they go off to retire for their deliberations. Some of you may have uh, read about the Rich Paul case uh, in, in New Hampshire. Rich Paul is a marijuana activist up in New Hampshire. And uh, he got busted for selling marijuana to an informant who had later, you know, later discovered who was working for the FBI. And he went to trial. His attorney made a nullification argument to the jury. But then just a few minutes later, the judge repeatedly emphasized to the jury, after the defense attorney said, you know, this is your option, this is your prerogative, the judge uh, emphasized to the jury that they had to follow the law as the judge explained it to them. So, you know, if there's any discrepancies between what the defense attorney was saying and what the judge was saying, the jury has to follow what he ha has said. So, the jury later returned with a guilty verdict. Now this case is on appeal. Rich Paul has appealed his conviction, and he's arguing that the judge in his case gave these improper instructions to run contrary to this new law that has been put in place in New Hampshire. So this case is now going to be decided by the Supreme Court of New Hampshire, and we should have a ruling in about, uh, you know, in the next few months, up to the next, somewhere in the next six months. So what's the bottom line here? You know, we've, we've, we've got this new law, but we've got these judges undermining it. Where are we on all this? Well, actually, I think we're in a pretty good place. If the New Hampshire Supreme Court orders a new trial for Paul and slaps down what this trial judge has done, then we're back in business and we're even stronger than we were before because we've got this recent ruling from the New Hampshire Supreme Court saying, this is the law and we're going to follow it. If the New Hampshire Supreme Court approves the shenanigans of what this trial judge did, I think it's very likely it's going to prompt a reaction from the legislature. And then we'll have a chance to write an even stronger and even more explicit law on what should be the nullification uh, arguments and procedures in trial courts there. And then, once we have this jurisdiction... Uh, where a nullification procedure is solidly in place for a while, we're going to demolish one of the primary objections we've heard over the years, which is the same, you know, the same dynamic we've got going on now with Washington and Colorado legalizing, right? We've got, finally got some jurisdictions to break this wide open and to say, look, now we're going to find out if there's problems or whether things uh, will work out fine. So, um, I think once we've got this... Uh, uh, one of these jurisdictions like New Hampshire up and running for a while, then we can go to these other states and say, look, we're doing it in New Hampshire. It affects some cases, but it's not a big deal. It's not like the sky is going to fall, right? So with my remaining time left, what I want to do is quickly address some of the other objections that I come across when I speak on this subject. And then I also want to underline the connection between jury nullification and the drug reform movement. Okay, here's the objections. When someone says jury nullification, it undermines the rule of law. The response is, no, jury nullification is a part of our law. It's part of the checks and balances in our constitutional system. Just as a pardon power is used by governors and the president, uh, the juries have the power to bring back acquittals. Okay? When someone says if a, a jury can nullify the law, that might blow back on the defendant and come back and hurt him. The response to that is, we can set it up in such a way where the defense will be in control. 
where the defense, it'll be totally up to the defense whether they want their defense attorney to make a nullification argument to the jury. Or it's up to the defense to ask for a jury nullification instruction from the judge. It's kind of like the option, defense has to make tactical options in every trial, such as whether or not they're going to testify in court. It's totally up to the defense if they want to exercise that option or not. So this idea that it's going to blow back on the defense, you know, it, it doesn't have merit if we set it up in this way, so that it's up to the defense's option. The third objection. When somebody says, well, jury nullification, that violates the oath that jurors take. The response to that is, well, if there's any problem, the problem is the way in which these oaths are written. Not, the problem is not with the ability of jurors to vote according to their conscience. That's the way to handle that objection. Now, let me quickly address the connection between jury nullification and the drug reform movement. Again, in Washington and Colorado, we won through the initiative process by going around the politicians. The jury nullification is another mechanism to go around the politicians by going directly to the people in the community. Now, my role on this panel has been to report on developments in New Hampshire and the prospects for other laws, again, turning to lawmakers in the state legislatures and the prospects for success in other states, which I think actually are pretty good in, in many of the red states like Montana, Iowa, Oregon, Texas, Arizona, even here in Colorado. But in the meantime, before these state legislative battles, in the meantime, we can accelerate the pace for reform by simply spreading the word about jury nullification. And I know Kirsten and Steve are going to be talking about how to get the word out through activism and through social media. That is so important. There aren't many people here who have close ties to politicians, but I bet everybody here has a family member, a friend, uh, an acquaintance, a neighbor, a co-worker who has received or is going to receive a jury summons. It's going back to what Lindsay was saying at the beginning. Don't let these opportunities slip by. In 10 minutes, you can share important information about jury nullification from your laptop or your iPad. Blast this information to all of your contacts. When, and when we do win an acquittal from time to time, and the news media reports on these acquittals, that's another opportunity to get start this cycle all over again. You take that news story and you blast it to all your contacts, planting the seeds again for a future case by reminding people that the nullification prerogative is out there and that they can use it when the situation is right. As Clay said, jury nullification played a role in accelerating the end of alcohol prohibition. And I think we should put it to greater use uh, to accelerate the demise of this drug war. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to introduce Kirsten Tynan, who is the National Coordinator for the Fully Informed Jury Association. She has been a grassroots pro-liberty activist for more than 20 years. And she's going to give us an overview of what FIHA, or the Fully Informed Jury Association, does in the area of jury nullification, activism, advocacy, and education. Thank you very much. I think there was someone who was... Oh, there you go. Um, if you would kindly pass out the packets. Um, I have some materials in these packets that I'll be referring to throughout this talk. Uh, we actually pronounce it Fiji, by the way. <laughs> um, as Lindsay said, I'm National Coordinator for the Fully Informed Jury Association, and I'll be discussing what Fiji does. But first, I'd like to start by talking about um, some historic cases I've come across in researching a book that FIJA will be publishing next year. And I think they will help me make a point about how jury nullification is relevant at specifically a drug policy conference. So let's start with this excellent article from the New York Times from 1928. This article refers to the trial of George Bevin, a defendant who was um, brought up on an alcohol violation. His jurors were hauled in before the judge so that he could scold them and uh, uh, give them a talking to for their very diligent methodology during deliberation. This methodology 
involved um, investigating the facts. They were provided um, with the evidence in the case, and from the New York Times article, quote, the jurors all admitted drinking the pint of liquor, which was the prosecution's chief exhibit against Bevin. All denied it was consumed without an honorable motive. <laughs> they stated it was sampled to determine whether it was of alcoholic content and actually constituted a violation of the liquor law, end quote. Subsequently, after they realized they had no evidence against the, the defendant, they realized they were forced to acquit. He was not guilty. I love this jury. This jury gave prohibition laws exactly the amount of respect they were due, and that is none at all. <laughs> and we see, a lot of, we see a lot of comparisons between alcohol prohibition and the drug war that I'm going to talk about briefly. Alcohol prohibition was passed through a rigorous constitutional amendment process, but the war on drugs was much more easily instituted by presidential edict and statutory law. Alcoholic prohibition, like the drug war, was a huge failure, but it was repealed in just over 13 years, whereas we've had 40 plus years of the destructive war on drugs. The court system was heavily clogged with alcohol violation cases, and prosecutors leaned heavily on the plea bargain to clear the system. They were relatively very generous with those pleas. On the other hand, now 90% of felonies, many of which are drug cases, never even get to a jury trial. And that is because prosecutors are very maliciously stacking charges. We're seeing mandatory minimums. We're seeing drug courts and other elements that are tilting the playing field bullying defendants into foregoing their right to trial by jury and taking a plea bargain. And those plea bargains are, of course, much harsher than they would have been during Prohibition. We're also seeing a two-tiered system in our society, just as we did during Prohibition. Uh, back then, uh, prominent members of the community, often government officials, would have their own private entrances to speakeasies so that they could violate the law in the privacy and comfort that they desired. Uh, in, the, in the current situation, we actually have adults alive today who have never had a president who hasn't violated a drug law. Yet none of these presidents have ever been prosecuted uh, under the laws that are typically used to ruin other people's lives, and especially used very harshly against low-income individuals and people of color. And as a panel that is not notably diverse by outward appearances, I think we would be shamefully remiss if we didn't acknowledge the egregiously disproportionate use of the drug war to damage communities of color. And with that, let's go back a little bit further to 1850 um, during slavery in the United States. Um, on the left, you see a graphic, um, which I think Steve in particular will appreciate. These were the first, uh, were early flex your rightsers. <laughs> they are, uh, Specifically, this is a flyer from Boston in um, April of 1851, urging people not to talk to the police and indeed to shun the police. Uh, this was a couple of months after um, a fug an alleged fugitive was captured named Shadrach Minkins, which led to a series of, of cases called the Shadrach Rescue Cases. The individuals who helped this person escape to Canada were prosecuted under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was a key part of the Compromise of 1850, which was a set of federal laws crafted to keep the Union together with a tenuous balance between free and slave states, and it imposed upon people in free states numerous objectionable pr provisions, including that private citizens would be obligated legally to assist in the capture of people who are alleged to be fugitive slaves, and that those, fugi those alleged fugitives would not have a trial by jury, instead they would have a trial by a commission. Often those commissioners would get paid twice as much to, if they agreed to return the individual to slavery, rather than if they, acqu uh, they acquitted. And in fact, they could be returned to slavery, or even in fact sent to slavery, a, a free person, simply on the claim of an individual that they said that they owned this person. Um, the second set, uh, oh, the, I should also mention the Shadrach rescue cases were very notable because the government was going to use them as an example of how they were going to be able to make this compromise work. And they prosecuted them in the order in which they thought they would be most successful in getting prosecutions. 
After seven, the first seven consecutive trials, they gave up because they couldn't get a single conviction of any defendant, black or white. People of Boston protected their neighbors and did the right thing, ignoring law in the process. The other two um, items on this slide are from the Jerry Rescue cases. These were a similar set of cases for the rescue of a fugitive and um, helping him escape to Canada from New York. In this set of cases, we saw 26 trials with a single prosecution, which would likely have been overturned on appeal had the defendant not passed away in the process. And this was, this was a huge embarrassment for the government and in fact ruined political careers over this. And again, we can see some very notable comparisons between slavery and <coughs> Jim Crow era and drug prohibition now. Under slavery, blacks had no legal recourse at all. No rights, no legal recourse. Now, it's obviously not like that now, but we are kind of going back in that direction when we see Fourth Amendment protections circumvented for so-called public safety reasons. Blacks had no political participation, including serving as jurors or testifying on their own behalf under slavery, and even after slavery, poll taxes rigged so-called literacy tests and other things were used as preconditions to allow them into the system, thereby continuously keeping them disenfranchised. Now, instead of that, we see felony convictions which um, result in loss of voting rights, loss of, resulting in loss of jury participation, and so on. Again, disenfranchising people from the political process. Forced labor was the rule under slavery, but even after slavery, vagrancy laws mandated labor even for people who had previously been free. And if one was convicted for a so-called vagrancy violation, states could hire out the prisoners for no pay, uh, creating a condition of quasi-slavery. Well, the 13th Amendment left an opening for that by making an exception for involuntary servitude in the case of punishment for crime, and what do we see now? We see victims of the drug war being used as cheap labor in private prisons or being contracted out. And often they'll get paid something in the neighborhood of like 19 cents an hour. Um, under slavery, explicit racism was the law with separate penalties for whites and non-whites. Now we still, have we still have racism in the system, but it's more implicit. And we kind of hide it under the fact that the so-called laws apply to everyone. However, they are not enforced equally, and we can see that very measurably in racial disparities for arrests, convictions, sentencing, and e this is true even when corrected for factors such as frequency and severity of, of, of offenses. So what is going on here? We have spoken up repeatedly against both prohibition and slavery, but the war on drugs is insidiously being used to circumvent both of those statements made by the people. And in your packet, you'll find a little uh, container of sweet tarts, which just shows the level of maliciousness we've gone to. People are being prosecuted for less than the amount of, of drugs than, than you have in the, the sweet, sweet, sweet tart packet. So, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and I'd also like to mention, I'd like to reframe here something that Clay said. He referred to jury nullification as disingenuous fact-finding. And I'd like to suggest an alternative framing. I consider it a genuine finding that the law is, as applied in the case at hand is wrong, and I believe the true disingenuousness of the system is from laws that redefine vices which harm nobody as crimes. Crimes are actually things that harm people or property. And further disingenuousness, we, come, we, we saw it from Tim's talk in judges um, explicitly misinforming jurors of their rights. So with all of these parallels um, in these two situations, there is a notable missing parallel. Mass jury nullification undermined the Fugitive Slave Act and the Compromise of 1850, contributing to bringing emancipation. Mass jury nullification made a laughing stock of prohibition, but we're not seeing those things now. Jury nullification really should be a tool that we use to provide relief from the war on drugs and to protect all of our rights. And the fact that we're not makes me a little nuts. <laughs> I, I, I feel like that picture, it, I, I, it, it boggles my mind. Why do you think it's not being used? I'll, I'll, I will get to questions later. <laughs> um, 
but um, it is indeed a tool for policy change. And we can see that because two constitutional amendments were helped along to their, to their final passage through jury nullification. And in fact, the highest and best purpose of the independent jury is to protect each other from these unjust laws and abusive prosecutions imposed by government. And to quote two notable um, Americans, let's, let's, I agree with Nancy Reagan, let's just say no to these laws. And I also agree with Barack Obama that we can't wait. It's been 40 years, it's been far too long. Now, we saw earlier there are a number of lawyers in the room, but in fact, all of us are gonna have a hard time getting on juries, not just the lawyers. So it's not enough to simply hear this information and keep it to ourselves. We are, we are um, only called for jury duty once or twice in our lives, typically. And um, if we want to have informed jurors, we need to take this information back to our communities. And so that brings us to Fiji's mission, which is to educate everyone regarding their full power as jurors, including the ability to rely on personal conscience and to judge the merit of the law in its application and when necessary for justice to nullify bad laws. So just quickly because I get a lot of calls saying, you know, do, can you, you know, you have the word jury in your name, you know, can you do this legal thing for me? I want to clarify what we do and do not do. We are an educational outreach organization. We have 501c3 status. We are a source for credible documented information and we provide that on our website and, and through other means. And we are a primarily volunteer-driven and extraordinarily financially efficient organization. We are not staying at the conference hotel. We are staying in an Airbnb room that costs for four nights less than one night here. <laughs> so we are very, very tight with our donors' dollars and appreciate that people work hard for those and that we need to spend them very wisely. What we do not do is provide legal advice or representation either to people wanting to nullify or to activists who may encounter legal issues while they're, they're doing activism. We don't advocate for or against any case in progress, nor do we endorse any candidate or piece of legislation. And we don't swoop in with money and volunteers to fix problems for you. <laughs> I often get people calling the office who have a case that um, they are, are concerned about, and, but they've never done anything with jury nullification before, and they want us to come and fix their problem, and that just can't happen. We need to have an ongoing effort. And that ongoing effort includes, includes um, our website and social media where we distribute information. We also publish educational materials, some of which are in your packet. You each have, um, assuming I counted correctly, um, 12 flyers. Each of, the, each of those represents a single jury. So you have the tools to go out and create one fully informed jury or 12 hung juries. We also have a speaker's bureau and can provide someone for you in person if someone's available locally or by Skype if you're set up for that on your end. We do media outreach, um, including granting interviews and reviewing scripts and supplying information and prop kits to movie and television producers. And in fact, one of our calendars I, I think was featured on, I, I can't remember which of the crime dramas, but uh, we, actually, we actually had that in prime time. Uh, we have the Fiji infor information line where anyone can call us and leave their name and address. We will send them a jury power information kit. That is 1-800-T-E-L-J-U-R-Y. We are very active in communities doing sidewalk activism near courthouses, downtown, public transit stations, and so on. Um, hosting information events. Hemp fests are a very popular place for these tables among others. Um, we work with student groups, and here you see a few of our pictures. Um, you have Ed Fortune there on the left with the No Victim, No Crime uh, banner. We have a uh, county fair in Montana with our Fiji banner there. In the middle, we have um, someone from a Jury Rights Day event this year handing out literature. The fourth picture is in front of the Hall of Justice in San Diego where that week, uh, you can see them reading our literature, and that week there were two cases that uh, were likely nullifications, and there on the right, someone from our Florida campaign. Jury Rights Day is September 5th each year, commemorating the uh, trial of William Penn, 
And uh, here are some things from, from our previous Jury Rights Day celebrations. This year we had 26 events across the country. And we'd be happy to help you do that next year. We also have local campaigns, um, sometimes organized by us, sometimes organized by local activists or with other groups. And here on the right you see um, an ad. Fiji doesn't place ads, but people can raise money to place ads on our behalf. That is currently in the Judiciary Square uh, metro station in Washington, D.C. Um, we also have a program called Lunch Break for Liberty. I'd like to invite you to join me at lunch on Saturday, meet at the Fiji table at the beginning of the lunch break, bring your 12 flyers, we'll go up and down canvassing the 16th Street Mall. Uh, why not do Denver a favor while we're here? We have a huge force, right? <laughs> um, so we'll meet at the table, I'll give a little introduction to how we do it, and then we'll go walk down, hand out literature, and everyone can grab lunch when they want it. Um, so the last question is, you know, what can I do? Well. Aside from understanding your role and, and acting as a juror, you can engage in juror education in your community, and you can also help us continue our work with your volunteer efforts and contributions. What is at stake is huge. You can save reputations, you can save relationships, you can save people's livelihood or property, you can save their educations because they may not be able to get a student loan if convicted, you can save their freedom, and you can, in fact, save their life. I mean, even if, they weren't, even if it wasn't a death penalty case, people do get killed in prison. You cannot be required to check your conscience at the courthouse door. No victim means there is no crime. There is a difference between a vice and a crime. A crime involves harming a person or property. And if there is no victim, then the law is what is wrong, not the person. The person themselves is not guilty. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce our last speaker, Steve Silverman, who is the founder and executive director of Flex Your Rights, a civil liberties organization laser focused on improving the constitutional liberty of all Americans. Since 2002, Flex produced the popular educational movies Busted, A Citizen's Guide to Surviving Police Encounters, and 10 Rules for Dealing with Police. The Flex YouTube channel has surpassed 31 million views, and Flex is now developing a new movie called Jury Duty, What the Government Doesn't Want You to Know, which Steve will provide some more information on now. This Norman Rockwell painting is called The Jury. It debuted on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in 1959. And at that time, women were prohibited from serving on juries in three states. And 18 other states had some prohibitions on women uh, serving on juries. The predominant sexist attitude at the time suggested that women jurors would just crumple too easily uh, in the face of the intense psychological pressure of the jury deliberation room. And this painting is Rockwell's response to that. And one thing that, in particular, that strikes me about this painting is that the young woman, I think she could fit perfectly into a jury deliberation room today. And I think that other jurors the other ones there would definitely be probably more diverse. It wouldn't just probably just be one woman and a bunch of white dudes uh, hanging over here. But, um, but I think this actor would probably be wearing, she could even wear, if she, were, if she were an actor in a movie, for example, she could be wearing the exact same clothes and even holding that exact same pose. Um, I mean, maybe today she'd you know, be a, a punk rock chick. Maybe she's hiding some scene tattoos underneath that blouse, or maybe she's a hippie burner chick who, you know, just cut off her dreadlocks and pulled a few piercings out of her face uh, right after she received her jury summons. Um, but most importantly, she represents us. She represents the 58% of Americans who support, according to the most recent Gallup poll, the legalization of marijuana, yet we are routinely disqualified from serving as jurors in case where a nonviolent drug defendant's liberty is on the line. This discrimination 
must end. We can no longer allow the government to disqualify ourselves from this fundamental democratic process. This jury room is where we will take back our freedom. It is in this room where we will help bring down the end of the war on drugs. This, the, now it's the possibility of this profound systemic disruption of the war on drugs that is exactly why Fletcher Rice is now taking on jury nullification as the subject of our next big film. Our, our short-term goal is to produce a new training resource that at least matches uh, the quality and reach of our first two major film pro uh, projects and hopefully uh, even uh, exceeds that. As, uh, as uh, Lindsay mentioned, our YouTube channel has now, we've now reached 32 million views. Every time I take a peek at it, another million views. Uh, but, but here's the thing about this particular video and this topic that makes, I think, jury nullification even more exciting than our first two films. Because with our first two films, the goal was to keep individuals out of jail by teaching them how to flex their rights, um, their basic constitutional rights during police encounters. And I've received hundreds of emails and, and, and Facebook and YouTube comments, people saying, hey man, thanks so much, you've saved my ass. <laughs> and that's cool, that's definitely great, but you know, and, and, and in addition to that, we've gotten some viral videos of some brave individuals flexing their rights while videotaping the police. Um, but for the most part, uh, our successes are, are, are individualized um, and, and anecdotal and are also, as a, as a consequence, they're hard to quantify. But this project will be different. For one thing, each and every time one of our viewers is able to either secure an acquittal for a drug defendant or simply is just able to hang the jury and cause a mistrial because they uh, voted not guilty, this creates the potential for a viral media event, especially if that juror decides to speak out. And if we can inspire hundreds or even thousands of these jury nullification events within a short period of time, this will shock the shit out of police, prosecutors, judges, and lawmakers. And when these jury nullification events just continue to happen one after another with no end in sight, the powers that be will take notice that we the people will no longer tolerate drug war policies that violate our American values of liberty and justice for all. Well, so what's this film gonna look like? We already have our, we already have our, our sort of composite of our main hero, hero character. And so here's what's actually gonna happen in the narrative. For starters, our hero will simply show up for jury service. Instead of tossing that summons in the trash, like about 70% of us do. I don't necessarily meet people here, but 70% of, of, of uh, 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 summonses don't get responded to. Instead, she seized on this opportunity to do what is perhaps the single most important and powerful thing an individual citizen can do to stop the war on drugs. To put it another way, I would argue that being a trial juror is the most important and powerful political position that any of us are likely to serve in our entire lives. And so when, you, when we receive that summons, we can no longer trick ourselves into thinking we've got better things to do because we're already working to end the war on drugs. These individual opportunities to serve justice will never fit conveniently into our schedules, so we must all be ready to serve at a moment's notice. Now, um, can I, I want to take a, a quick audience poll. How many of you here have received a jury summons in the mail at some point in your lives? Grand jury. Okay. I think that's pretty much, well, it's everybody. Okay, now, I'll keep those hands up. How many of you have ducked your jury service, admit it, in one way or another you ducked it or you avoided, just like keep your, good. You, you notice my hand is still in the air. Like I, I confess to this, I, I blew off an opportunity to save somebody's life potentially. Um, I didn't even show up for jury service. This was a few years ago. This was just before we um, were about to go into production for our second film, Ten Rules for Dealing with Police. And I, I just thought I didn't want to risk potentially delaying that schedule, because it, it was such an important thing you know, I, that I had to do. But you know, I regret that decision. Um, I didn't 
I mean, a part of it is like I didn't yet understand at the time how much power I could have had to potentially save somebody's life. Um, and also, I just, you know, the other part of me is like I thought it would just be impossible to get on that jury because of my, because of my past views. But now I, I actually realize that that was bullshit. Um, that was just an excuse that I told myself. I, I could have figured out, potentially uh, put myself in a position to get on that jury. Um, it may have been hard for me, but uh, I sure as heck should have tried. And if I did get on the jury and was able to be in a position to potentially save somebody's life, uh, I could have you know, easily found a way to postpone you know, video production if I had to. So let's get back to, to our, our hero of the moment. Um, instead of making the same mistake that I did and a lot of us have made, she's going to make the best of her opportunity to serve justice. So, so the first thing she does after she gets her jury sobbins, uh, even before she cuts off her dreadlocks and pulls out her facial piercings, she, she goes and she Googles jury duty. Now this gets to the heart of the question that a lot of smart people are, are asking me, and it's this. How are you going to get people to see this film? Well, I have a, I want to sort of, I'd rather show you actually, if it's possible. Does anyone here have internet service in this room? Is that happening at all? Yes. It's some, so if anyone's got internet service, um, people in this side of the room, I want you to, to, to Google search police searches. Just Google police searches and people on this side of the room, if anyone has internet service, pull out your internet device and Google my rights. And just scream out like what's at the top of that of that search. <laughs> good, good, good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that that's still like that. Um, <laughs> because um, we're gonna do the exact same thing for jury duty. Number two was What was number one? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, please arrest the police search. Wait, that was for uh, for my rights or police searches? Yours was number two. Okay. Oh, it could be an ad. Yeah, okay. You had to put on ad block. Um, let's see. <laughs> in fact, uh, so so. Jury duty. So in fact, the, the movie will be called Jury Duty, as as uh, Lindsay mentioned. What the government doesn't want you to know. And um, Professor Paul Butler, the former federal prosecutor and current Georgetown law professor, who wrote the awesome book. Let's get free, a hip hop theory of justice. He's going to be our starring narrator, so he's going to sort of fill the role of like that Billy Murphy and Ira Glasser did. And now, um, now one thing I want people to appreciate uh, about flex rights is we didn't climb to the you know up the the slippery Google pole, um, nor did we reach 32 million YouTube video views because of some clever search engine optimization technique that, that some shady marketing company sold us. Uh, we, we accomplished this because we learned over these past 10 years how to create and distribute compelling online content and to use social media as a broadcast platform. So enough of that boring stuff. Let's get back to the story of our hero again. And we're kind of jumping back and around. But so, here, so she's now walking into the courthouse after she receives that jury summons. And she, sure enough, she's approached by a Fiji member handing her uh, a brochure, a, a jury rights flyer she already, but the thing is she already knows beforehand about her power to vote not guilty uh, if her conscience compels her to do just that. She's also ready for the first gauntlet of the jury selection process because this section, in my opinion, is gonna be the most important sort of dramatic and educational part of the film because this is where many reformers have I think arbitrarily disqualified themselves from the process. So instead of using jury uh, selection as an opportunity to expound on her views as a drug policy reformer, our hero chooses a path that is more likely to help set a drug war prisoner free and also to make a powerful public statement. And for my money, the two best articles right now that, that present the most clear-minded sort of strategic approach uh, to being an intelligent and conscientious juror are, one of them is Clay Conrad's A Guide to Surviving as a Juror. And that one just, that has all the little, it just sort of the, the, the tactics you want. The other one is uh, called Jury Nullification, The Top Secret Constitutional Right uh, by Professor James Duane. And our movie will borrow lots of tips <laughs> from these articles which show you how to uh, 
how uh, answering prosecutors and judges' questions truthfully is something that you can do in a way uh, and even improve your odds of getting selected. And so it's like, my favorite tip actually from Clay's article is where he says, for example, if you're, if you're asked in a drug case, if you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going through the selection process, would you be able to put your opinions inside and vote not guilty? Oh, rather, let me misstate that. Would you be able to put your, would you be able to put your opinions aside and vote guilty? What's the correct answer to that? What's the correct answer when you're asked that? Yeah. Would you be able to? Yeah. Hell yeah! Yeah, it has. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, we don't seem too excited, of course, but yes, of course I could. I mean, of course you could shove your arm down a garbage disposal. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean you're legally committed to doing so, and you can always change your mind later. And so really the key to, the key to improving your odds um, of getting picked for the jury is to always present yourself as having an open mind or perhaps even a mind that maybe hasn't yet given a whole lot of thought to the issue just yet. Do some yoga beforehand. Just clear your mind. Clean slate. <laughs> just keep to the natural stuff, though, just before you go into this situation. Um, so I, oh, I should mention one more important thing about this case, um, about our hero. She's going to be a juror in a high-profile federal, perhaps, medical marijuana case. Think of, uh, you know, Ed Rosenthal uh, and his jury. And, uh, and I also don't, uh, I feel terrible spoiling the ending for you, but our hero is going to vote not guilty. Uh, but of course, before, before that happens, you're, you're the inside group here, so, uh, but of course uh, the judge and jury will not make that easy. She is going to have to stick to her guns and she's going to have to resist saying anything that smacks of any knowledge of jury nullification. So what can our hero do to reasonably persuade other jurors to vote not guilty? Uh, when there doesn't seem to be much reasonable doubt or even technical guilt, maybe she could try to open up some doubt about the trustworthiness of the witness, you know, who probably cut a deal with the prosecutor to betray uh, the partner, or maybe she could even try to cast doubt on the political motivations of the ambitious lead prosecutor. I don't know. But even if she can't convince anyone to change their mind, even if she's all alone, our hero will stick to her guns and vote her conscience and calmly repeat, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Thank you. to all of our panelists. I'm very happy that we have a healthy amount of time left for Q&A. So first we're going to, um, we have a story that's going to be told by one of our audience members and then we will get to your questions. I am so glad that Silverman invited me to this panel. My name is Dorothy Gaines. Um, I was serving a 20-year federal sentence in federal prison. I was sentenced in 1995. And I'm thinking what he was saying about jury nullification. During my trial, there was no evidence against me, period. I was convicted because I would not give information. They thought I had information against the guy that was in the case. And I remember during the trial, a guy, they asked this guy to point out who had bought an ounce of crack cocaine from him. And he looked around the room and he looked at everybody in the audience and he looked over in the jury box and he said, I bought, she is the one that bought an ounce. He picked out a juror. <laughs> they went on a break. They knew that he had messed up. And they come back and say that, oh, it was that woman, but when I saw her last and bought the crack cocaine, she was much smaller and she wore glasses, which was a coat of Four of us was tried together. There was no evidence. Today is a very emotional day for me. 20 years ago, Drug Policy Alliance featured my story. My son was then nine years old, fighting for me to get out of prison. And that's him, this story right here. Show a little mercy, he was only nine years old. Today, his birthday, He's 29 years old. He is in prison because of 
the war on drugs. That was him visiting me in prison at that time. This is me and his baby and family that we are now visiting him. Nobody knows how hard it is when I went to have the first visit and I was there when they say count. And I remember when he was there, when they said count me. Nobody knows how hard it was when I walk out that door and I look back through the fence and see him. And 20, 13 years ago, before President Clinton released me, he was watching me leave the prison. <clears throat> so jury nullification is important if the jury would listen. There were many jurors say they would not have found me guilty. That was taken out of the jury room. But because of all the things that they do in the federal system and all the underlying dirty things they do, they even had a guy, I had a public defender because I couldn't afford a lawyer. And one of the co-defendants the government had asked him and begged him to come and talk to him that I had nothing to do with the case. He said, I will not waste my time because I know without a shadow of doubt He's going to get his time off by testifying against you. So the government put him on the stand against me, but he testified for me in, on the government's time and told him I had nothing to do with the case. And they asked him, that if you testify for, against her, we'll let you walk today with 14 years. And I got 20 years more than Kingpin got. But thank God to DPA, Families Against More uh, Mandatory Minimum, November Coalition, OSI, and everybody fought for me that I had a commentation in 2000, two days before Christmas by President Bill Clinton. But the suffering now is that I'm suffering with my only boy locked up. My only son that's 29 years old today that the drug war tore my home apart because I was the only living parent. His father died at two years old. He got on drugs, he wrote to the president and told him he wanted to kill himself, he tried to kill himself three times, that he had nothing to live for. And this is what the war on drugs destroyed with my family. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that amazing personal story and for showing the power that jury nullification could have had in this case. So why don't we go right here to this gentleman in the, in the jacket. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jesse. I have a quick comment to the audience and a serious question for all of our panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to invite you all to a networking event we're having tomorrow, Saturday at 1.30 in Governor's Square 10 for lawyers, legal workers, under the auspices of the National Lawyers Guild Drug Policy Committee. So again, that's tomorrow, Saturday at 1.30 in Governor's Square 10. My question is, I wanted to ask you your advice. Uh, how can you uh, advise or console someone who's contacted by the government after nullifying? I have a close friend who recently successfully hung a federal drug sales jury, and he called me and I congratulated him on exercising this important constitutional right. And only a few weeks later he called to say, the FBI is calling me, they want to talk to me about my jury service. And I was curious what our experts on the panel would advise, uh, we tell people who are concerned about the government tampering, interfering, or trying to retaliate against someone who's exercised this important right. Can I get that one? Oh. Well, first, Nobody should ever talk to the FBI unless, <laughs> unless you are subpoenaed to a grand jury. That's, and even then, you should talk to a lawyer before you do so. Anything you say can be used against you, of course. Not only that, but any misstatements you make might be deemed a false statement and then can be used to indict you. That's how they got Martha Stewart. And uh, she can probably afford better lawyers than anyone in this room. So when the FBI comes knocking at your door, uh, unless your child has been kidnapped, you probably want to say no comment. I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up question to that. Um, is it the case, though, that people who have nullified and who have been public about it, has there been any legal repercussions for those individuals? The 
The, answer, the short answer is no. There was a woman named Laura Creho that some of you might know about. She's from Colorado. Uh, she was charged after her jury duty with perjury for allegedly not being candid during jury selection. That case was thrown out on appeal because she was honest in answering the questions that she was asked. She didn't lie. They were upset that she didn't volunteer information that the prosecutors felt she knew they wanted to know. Uh, so they suck at void and it's just all Exactly, exactly. They didn't ask the right questions because they were afraid, A, they were going to put ideas <coughs> into the minds of the jurors, and B, they didn't want to offend anybody, so they didn't ask penetrating questions. She didn't volunteer information. That's okay, you don't have to volunteer anything. During jury selection, you have to tell the truth. You don't have to volunteer anything. You don't have to be any more specific than the question demands. If they say, could you do something? Yeah. Would you do something? I don't know, I haven't seen the evidence yet. Um, but you don't have to be any more specific than the question demands. You don't have to volunteer anything. Uh, now, if they ask, have you ever attended a drug reform conference? You would have to say yes. Uh, my personal feeling is if I was on jury duty, I would continue to be vague. If they did nail me, then I would probably make a short two or three sentence speech in order to infect the rest of the juror pool. And then I would sit down and they would kick me off later, but they would probably have to end up dismissing the jury panel and starting over well, again. But, yeah, I mean, you got to do what you can do, but you can't lie. That would be perjury. That would be a felony. Short of that, it's open. You can do what you like. I would just like to add to that, um, there's, there's kind of a two-tier system of punishment. <laughs> there is being convicted and actually getting fined or sentenced, but there is also being harassed by the government, and there is actually another juror, Carol Asher, who was pursued on, on charges over her jury nullification, but it was dropped because the prosecution realized what sort of evidence the jury would be seeing <laughs> if, if, she, if they went along with the prosecution. Obviously, the jury would be informed about jury nullification. <laughs> so she, she was not convicted of anything, but certainly there is a level of punishment involved in being harassed like that, and it did cost her several thousand dollars. That said, those situations are very rare, and I hope that uh, I can talk with the gentleman afterwards about this situation. Uh, that's something that we really like to keep informed on. So, and, and also, I hope the first three people who ask questions come up and see me afterwards because I have some giveaways for you. Thank you all for the work you do. My name is John Delaney. I'm a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I've been a trial court judge in the state of Texas for 30 years now and a lawyer for 40 years. <clears throat> As you can imagine, I have some mixed feelings. I'm a drug reformer, but I'm, uh, um, you know, I, label, uh, I labor in the garden of law. And I've had about 570 jury trials now. And I'm concerned that this whole notion of jury nullification has the potential for some mischief, uh, unintended consequences. I think about the prosecutions in Mississippi in the 1960s where white men killed freedom riders. And uh, loyal members of the community refused to convict. Um, I think about the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, which we have the flip of your argument, where the government's case was aided by the racial prejudice of the 12 white men on the jury. I know from quite a bit of experience that jurors are not always driven by the highest moral values. There's some evil that lurks there in the community, just as it does in the halls of government. So, um, enough of that editorializing. I'd like to ask a technical question about the New, the New Hampshire law. When it says that the defense is entitled to argue 
what does that do about the defense's rights during voir dire and the government's rights during voir dire to take people off the panel? Yeah, I think Clay Conrad has, in his book, he has an entire chapter addressing the problem of uh, racist verdicts, which is a common objection that does come up. And I'll let uh, Clay address that. Um, but, you know, the quick response is, uh, I think, uh, to use Clay's word, he's like, juries are sometimes scapegoat, scapegoated because there's a potential for abuse there. We have to remember that police officers have discretion to make arrests. Sometimes that is, discretion is abused. Uh, prosecutors have discretion about whether they bring charges and how many types of charges. So the prosecutor, prosecutorial power can also be abused. We don't take away the government's power because their powers have the potential for abuse. And, but it's some, sometimes when people talk about juries because there's a potential for abuse, they want to take away the jury's prerogative uh, for a leniency. So I think we have to put it back into that perspective. Going back to your question about voir dire, uh, there's still, uh, to me, my understanding is the, the voir dire uh, procedures haven't changed because of the New Hampshire law. So there, whatever the voir dire um, procedures were before, there hasn't been much change there. If you have a malevolently racist community, what kind of sheriffs are they going to elect? What kind of judges are they going to elect? What kind of district attorney are they going to elect? Uh, if you have a malevolently racist community, there ain't no way you're getting justice. In the uh, Byron Della Beckwith trial in Mississippi, in the first trial, two police officers got up and testified that Byron Della Beckwith was hundreds of miles away at the time Medgar Evers was getting himself shot, their words. In the Emmett Till murder trial, the sheriff uh, would stand at the door and greet the black congressmen and black journalists that came to uh, the trial with cat calls of, hello nigger. What kind of justice are you going to get in that community? But it's easy to blame the jury for what the sheriff and the prosecutor and the judges have done because the jury doesn't exist after the trial. So you can say, oh, it was the jury's fault. But you know, a grand jury from that same community indicted. Um, and then we have the federal civil rights trials that followed after the state acquittals. And those ended in convictions. Juries from the same community, they convicted. What was the difference? It was the judges, it was the prosecutors, it was the investigators. But you can always blame the jury because they don't exist after the trial is over. Now, are juries perfect? Of course not. Is jury nullification perfect? Of course not. Any power, any prerogative can be abused. But I will say, that a panel of 12 diverse citizens acting through deliberation are less likely to abuse their power than the judge or the prosecutor or the police. That they are more likely to act in the interests of justice than one person or a small group of like-minded people acting in the privacy of a closed office. That would be my judgment. So I would say out of all the actors in the criminal justice system, the jury is the least racist, and that is backed up in death penalty cases, where it has been shown that yes, a black man is more likely to be sentenced to death for killing a white man than in any other situation, because he's more likely to be prosecuted and charged with a capital offense. The discretion is almost always on the part of the prosecutor, maybe a small percentage on the part of juries, but very small compared to the discretion that the prosecutor uh, tends to have and the impact the prosecutor has in that disparity. Thank you for that question.